Samsung has launched the Galaxy S8 and S8 Plus. Of course, last week they've gone hell for leather for a futuristic design after the Note 7 debacle, and they might just about pull it off. It's all glass both sides and as much of it as possible, and yes, you'll need a case of some kind in day-to-day -day life. With an odd in terms of displaying standard content 185 by 9 aspect ratio, they both managed to deliver a large screen without forcing the phone itself to be extra wide, the bugbear of previous phablets. Samsung even ditched the physical home button at long last, and you can alter the layout of the virtual controls, putting the back button on the correct side. The tech specs are similar with the 5.8 and 6.2 inch diagonals, the main separators. Also, the larger phone is a 3500mAh battery, the smaller 3000, both with 4GB of RAM and a Snapdragon 835 or Exynos 8895 chipset. The cameras are the same as on the older S7, but still decent, and there's a Google like multi frame processing set of tricks. Gimmicky in the extreme or a stroke of genius? I tend to the former. It's a new button assigned Bixby Digital Assistant. It's a Google Assistant competitor that does have loads of hooks into Samsung's Internet of Things, should you own lots of these in your home. Other specs of note include 64 gig storage plus micro SD, various fast and wireless charging options, a 3.5 mil headphone jack, yay, a mono loudspeaker, boo, and a full IP68 waterproofing. It's a bit of a geek's game, admittedly, designing the perfect, the ultimate smartphone in your head, a concept. Except that most people overdo it and they reach far too far into the future and unreality, so their creation can't actually be made, at least not for a sensible price. I did this briefly in audio form a few weeks ago on the Phone Show Chat audio podcast, but I wanted to formalise my thoughts here and present them on camera. You see, I think a perfect smartphone can be made in terms of design and hardware specifications and for no more than a £500 purchase price, significantly less than today's flagships. I'm sure that the likes of OnePlus agree with me, since as you'll see, their current 3T isn't too far off what I'm suggesting, but I wanted to add my own slant. I should perhaps put a choice of operating system, Android, iOS or Windows 10 Mobile to one side since everyone will have their own favourite anyway. The OS is largely irrelevant to what follows, and let's face it, apart from some app unavailability, the operating systems and interfaces, they largely do the same job. Let's work from the inside out and start with the chipset. The latest Galaxy S8 comes with the still rare Snapdragon 835, which is state of the art from Qualcomm, but it's not exactly essential for a phone that doesn't also have to work as a desktop. Think of Samsung DeX or Microsoft Continuum. A slightly more humdrum Snapdragon 820 or 821 will do the job very nicely for most people and is a hundred times more readily available. Couple that with four gigabytes of RAM for some degree of future-proofing. Those three gig units still work super smoothly in my experience these days. Storage is less important these days of streaming media, but you still need 32 gigabytes internally for apps and games, and I'd recommend 64 gig to make sure there's plenty of space for captured photos and videos too. Add a micro SD card if you like, but it's not quite so essential, I think. At the phone's heart should be a biggish battery. I think we've seen a cusp in the thin trend now, thankfully, and phones are starting to get slightly thicker again. 10 mil, i.e. one centimeter is absolutely fine. A little depth, in fact, makes the phone easier to hold and allows for a larger battery, think 3500 milliamp hours. As you'll see from my comment on materials later on, Qi wireless charging should be a go too. Down at the bottom of the phone has to be a reversible high current charging port, whether USB Type-C or Apple's Lightning, just as long as it's not micro USB, fiddly, single-sided and not all that robust. Samsung and Google here agree with me, a 3.5mm headphone jack is needed, whatever Apple and HTC might lead you to believe. It's not just about legacy, it's about not making one port double up for charging and audio because you'll often want to do both at the same time. Yes, you can go Bluetooth, but that's not to everyone's taste and there are charging, dropout and overall quality issues unless you're very, very careful about your setup. Staying with audio, you all know I'm a big fan of front-facing stereo speakers, so these are a must. They're also pretty common now, from last year's Nexus to the iPhone 7 to all recent Sony flagships, phones from ZTE and Alcatel, and none of them hold a candle to my beloved Marshall London here, but hey, I'd settle for components of the same quality that Apple used in the iPhone 7 or Huawei used in the Nexus 6P. 
Either way, immersive sound when watching Netflix, YouTube or similar. And so do camera matters, one of my favourite topics. We've reached the limit of physics in recent years, I'd argue, with a 1 over 2.5 inch sensor, for example, large f over 1.7 aperture and OIS. So this level of unit is absolutely fine, together with a fast image processor. See that Snapdragon chipset mentioned earlier. And some clever software to expose your combinations, either Google's way or even the Nokia slash Microsoft way, as on my Lumias. In other words, we do need more than a bargain basement camera component, but we also don't need to invent something new, something that doesn't already exist. The megapixel count is pretty irrelevant, but 12 megapixels seems a sweet spot at 4x3 these days, working out to 9 megapixels, so at 16.9 with 4K video recording if needed for 8 megapixel frame grabbing. A lot of stats, but this was all very standard, even in 2016, so there should be no problem here. Biometrics are a subjective topic, but with the front of every phone needing as much room for display as possible, then we're looking at an iris scanner up at the top and a fingerprint scanner on the back as a minimum. And with both active at the same time, of course, and with NFC available for contactless payments. So far, so good then. What about the display? We've seen Samsung's and LG's latest stabs in the dark with 18.5 by 9 and 18 by 9 aspect ratio screens, but I'm not convinced yet by either in terms of handling media, which is almost exclusively in 16 by 9, if not 4 by 3 in the case of my old YouTube stuff. Be gone, black bars. And then there's display size and resolution. This is an ultimate smartphone after all, so let's aim on the big side. 5.5 inch diagonal, 16 by 9 display, 1080p if LCD or QHD if AMOLED according to taste, but both should be fine for almost everyone in a solid metal chassis that doesn't have taper-thin sides and can actually be used without a grippy TPU case. And the back needs to be metal or polycarbonate, not yet more fragile, slippery oleophobic glass, please. In fact, it should look something like this, and forgive the fact that this is a Lumia 930 from two or three years ago and runs Windows Phone. Look at the size, look at the form factor, look at the materials. Uh, and of course, you use virtual controls with a bigger display on the front, easily done. Let's look back. I've asked for good components throughout and of highest spec, but there's nothing here too outlandish. In fact, this ultimate smartphone should easily come in at a fully profitable £500 retail price in the UK. It just needs someone to put the right pieces in place and it needs a manufacturer not to charge an extra 30% premium for their logo. <coughs> Google, <coughs> Apple. Aside from the stereo speakers, all of this is more or less matched by the mainstream OnePlus 3T, in fact, and even with the new post-Brexit pricing comes in at well under £450. So it can be done. Comments welcome on my ultimate smartphone. Stick the OS of your choice in and you won't need a new phone until 2020.